Welcome to today's episode of On the Rocks. Today, I'm excited to welcome back to the podcast one of our original guests, Tara Christie. On this episode, we chat about the disconnect in the market right now between gold prices and gold company stock prices. We talk about what's going on in the Yukon with Banyan Gold, what true community engagement looks like, and how to determine whether going high-tech is actually right for an individual exploration or mining project. With over 20 years of experience in the mining industry, Tara is a geologist and gold exploration expert with a passion for developing projects that have the potential to become mines. She is the president and CEO of Banyan Gold, a company focused on advancing Yukon-based projects that offer significant exploration upside and proximity to infrastructure. She is also the president of the Victoria Gold Yukon Student Encouragement Society, a registered Canadian charity that works to increase attendance in Yukon schools by providing incentives and support to students and families. With that, pour a glass and let's dive in. So I should say welcome back to On the Rocks, Tara. Like I, I should have looked when we got on. You were one of our original, our like first round back when this was like during COVID, just having cocktails over Zoom, right? Yeah. Well, and that was how you started it, right? Because that's all you could do is have cocktails over Zooms and look at how successful it's become. Uh, some great people came on your show. I know. And here we are like years later. Yeah. Um, yeah, so really excited to have you back on. And as a lot of our most of our listeners are probably watching gold prices and what's going on in the market. So it's a really exciting time. Well, most episodes, we try to be topical and not too timely with what's going on in the market, but we've got to chat about it. Like, what do you think is going on with gold prices right now? What What, what is going on in the world? Well, I think just about every mining person is talking about it. And, you know, there are people like, oh, is it too fast, too much, too soon? You know, is it central banks? And, you know, is it sustained? And, you know, I think we all know that there's huge volumes of capital out there. And the, the amount that's currently in the mining space totally compared to a lot of other sectors, there's a lot of room for a lot of capital to move if there was actually interest in it. So, I, you know, I know um, you're having lots of these conversations too. And, um, you know, people have, you know, you hear all sides of the debate. Uh, for me, I think it's a great time to be in the gold business and for it to be a junior. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's uh, certainly it's been going on for a little bit. We've seen prices going up. And even when everybody was at PDAC or PDAC, however, I know we have heard some very uh, folks were very adamant about how you pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> got yelled at for calling it PDAC. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, even then folks were like, oh, gold's on the move. Like, we're finally going to start to see stuff open up a little bit. And now, you know, gold prices have continued to go up. And I was sharing with you before we pressed record, like, I'm hearing really interesting things that a lot of the gold price is driven by central banks buying up physical metal. And I think also just general global uncertainty, of course, like it, historically gold has been a hedge for risk, right? So some of that is likely going on, but do you have any theories that you like or subscribe to about what's driving the price? Well, you know, I think we've been so depressed and undervalued for quite a while that, you know, we're bound to have a correction on it. And the gold price hasn't, you know, while it's done fairly well overall, if you look kind of as an investment, it has a, actually a pretty good track record if you look over a 20, 30 uh, year time period. But compared to other assets, it still hasn't performed uh, comparatively well. So I think I think we will see a re-rate. And, you know, what do I know? I'm a junior explorer and there's this big world out there. And so I have some some views on it. Um, you know, I, I certainly think it's pretty predictable what's going on right now. You know, the metal first and then the senior producers that are actually ca cash flowing because of that demand for the metal. And then, you know, the interest should go to the smaller developers and then it should come to the quality explorers. And, um, you know, I don't, I think once it trend, if, if there actually is that big move of capital from some of these other sectors that are so highly valued, you know, that's really significant just because the global percentage of wealth or, you know, capital in the mining sector is actually relatively small. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take a whole lot to move into mining to make a huge impact on, on what's going on in the sector, right? Because we are so small, I hate to put it that way, but so small compared to 
other industries back. I mean, everyone. <laughs> we think we're big because it's our world, right. right? When you're in mining, that's all you kind of think about. But, you know, I was uh, I was down in Seattle and talking to some tech sector guys this week and, you know, their perception and, and you know, like, oh, yeah, gold, gold is going up and, you know, their world does not involve mm-hmm. mining at all. Um, and so for them to be looking at, and there's a lot of money, I, I didn't realize just how many billionaires there were now in Seattle. It's uh, an interesting uh, related to tech, but I, I think that it won't take a lot um, if we can get some of that interest moved over. Yeah, that would be a that would be a cool infographic or stat, like how many billionaires are there in mining versus billionaires in tech, right? Because um I always hear the the stat that the entire market cap of the mining industry is smaller than Apple or Tesla, right? Like the, that's, and that kind of gets as, as prospector, of course, is a, a tech company in the mining space. We get that kind of thrown at us from the VC world. Like, wow, you guys are just small, right? It's like, but we're so important. <laughs> like, small, but mighty make everything else. Right? You know, um, but it does seem that, I mean, of course, people react to gold even completely different from even critical minerals. So that's got its own little kind of fandom going on and great policies headed towards that. But, to, you know, historically, folks have moved into gold at in certain time periods when there is uncertainty or different things go on in the larger market. And I know I hear a lot of folks complain that, especially within the juniors, that that capital has not come in because a lot of it went into like crypto and tech, especially during COVID, right? Like the the capital that normally go in there, especially at the early stage projects has not come in. Um, Do you think, are are you seeing any changes from that or hearing anything? You know, I'm hearing some of it. And I, I think we're seeing people sniffing around and starting to look at it. You know, I haven't seen it specifically come into Banyan yet, mm-hmm. uh, but I have had some, a lot of interesting cold, incoming calls, which are like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. And, you know, just like anything you got, is this real? You know, where is this coming from? Um, and, and it's been tough in the sector. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of, you know, remember PDAC, there was an awful lot of people that were very depressed about yeah. the stocks and markets and had no cash. And, you know, that's one thing that we've done right. And so why, you know, I've kind of been able to just focus on where do we need to go is we've had cash. And so that's been, you know, my staff is stable, mm-hmm. company's stable. Um, we've really been able to dig into technical work to like improve the quality of, of the asset that we have and plan. Um, so I, I realize, I appreciate that um, not everybody was in that position. And, you know, a lot of people have laid people off recently. Um, so that's, uh, and yet we've got these, and that's that disconnect. Here's this great gold price that we haven't seen reaching all time highs um, and excitement for the metal. And yet a lot of the small companies are not, not sharing in that love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that is exactly what folks at, at PDAC were saying. And even, even last year, but I think this year was a little bit more, um, the what I heard and and it, uh, some of it even started at Beaver Creek last fall just chatting with folks they're like the market's just not it's not giving us any value like even when we make great you know news when we drill we find good results we announce it like the market's just not appreciating that uh, right now so a lot of folks that I talked to were like we're just gonna basically take a knee you know and kind of wait for the market to adjust but those were mostly folks that did not have you know, the cash to continue, like you said, being strategic and pushing through with their plans. So with that, what 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 is going on with Banyan? What what are your plans? What are you all working on? Well, this year we put out a new resource, 7 million ounces, grade of 0.63. And, and people say, oh, is that enough? Is that grade high enough? Well, it's just like Victoria Gold down the road. But the other interesting thing is we've been really modeling and looking at it. And if you look at the cutoff grades, you know, within that, there's 4 million ounces of a gram. And you can see the distribution across the deposit of that. Mm-hmm. But if you use a 0.9 cutoff, there's actually 2.4 million ounces at 1.45. And and so if you look at the 3D model of that, you know, one of the things that we're doing is some scoping studies, kind of looking at what the economics are early, you know, pre-PEA stuff to really help you um, understand the economics and the key drivers and the things that we can do to really move the needle. But if you look at that, 
is there enough of that 1.45 or that one gram for your starter pits, which really drive your IRR? You know, this is a very big deposit, five kilometers of strike. We've only drilled it down to 200 meters, but we know mineralization goes to 650 meters because we've drilled one deep hole. Um, So, you know, those are, these are generational assets and this is a district. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the discoveries and Snowline has a fabulous discovery out to the east, um, Sitka's to the west, and we're in this central tombstone and one of the real benefits that we have is we've got existing roads and power and the same potential as these other deposits and we've already got seven million ounces i can see a view and potential for seven million or 10 million plus ounces where we are um and so now our challenge is really to show that we've got enough of the grade the other really interesting thing for us is we haven't found our intrusion yet you know Snowline and victoria gold have found their intrusions sitka's found theirs we're still in the rocks around it And we have five kilometers of mineral, which is really unusual. Like that's a very unusual deposit to be that big somewhere around it. Normally it's like a kilometer. We actually, you know, a few of the uh, academics had to actually change their figures because our our one normal one kilometer is now five kilometers uh, of surface expression. So, you know, I think it's a pretty exciting time for the Yukon. And you can tell that because I I get excited about these (laughs) things and... uh, we have options on what we can do. You know, we've been working really diligently on understanding the structural geology, kind of what's controlling our high grade, where the distribution of it is, how that relates with the engineering parts of it. And that'll really prepare us well when we want to go drilling again. We, we held off going drilling because the market wasn't appreciating it last year. You know, we've added 58 ounces per meter we've drilled and we were doing that consistently. And last fall, the market didn't care. So, um, you know, why drill if nobody cares? Yeah, it's uh... that's what it's exactly what I think the kind of consistent I think you guys were were saying that a little earlier than other folks, right? Um, but uh, yeah, well, and to back up for folks, and they should go back and listen to our, our original episode with you. But do you want to give just a little bit of an overview of Banyan and, and oh. for folks who I, I realize as we jumped in and started talking, they probably don't know <laughs> where you are or <laughs> the context. Yeah. Of, of the- oh, good detail. Yeah. Yeah. So Banyan Gold, we are an advanced exploration company located in the Yukon. Um, We have about a hundred million market cap right now. Um, We put together this project. We optioned it in 2017 with no resource on it. Uh, very rapidly drilled it off, but 120,000 meters of drilling to now get to our 7 million ounce resource that we just put out here in 2024. We also, so we're an intrusion related gold deposit, but we're in the meta sediments, which are around it. So, you know, these rigs deposits within this tombstone mineralized gold belt, which, you know, these belts are, you know, you usually make a discovery and then there's more discoveries in it. So it's actually a pretty exciting location. And the other really exciting things about us is we have existing all season roads roads, power, hydropower already across the property, even cell phone service and fiber optic cable on the property. So, you know, infrastructure is also really important. Yukon, you know, it's a safe jurisdiction where you can permit. There's been two mines permitted right beside us. So I think those are all real key advantages for us. And it's part of the story of who who Banyan is. You know, we've got this great asset. We've got two mines right beside us, Victoria Gold and Hecla, both of which will grow. And with these gold prices and silver prices, uh, we'll be cash flowing. But at 7 million ounces, we're a very desirable standalone asset for any company or in addition to either one of those companies or somebody who wants to come in and consolidate this district. And I think there will be consolidation in the sector coming out of um, what we've seen with with gold prices and and um, and in our area specifically, simply because you know when you've got twenty million plus ounces within you know twenty kilometers, you you really that's how you attract the big money and the big companies. And I remember even from our our original star, you've been so focused on that from a strategic like an exit strategy perspective. Like you were one of the first people that I talked to who had like a like a very clear, here's where this ends up, or here are the options of where the company ends up and the asset ends up. And, and, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, very strategic in terms of partnerships and alliances in the district um, in order to best kind of position the company and the asset from that perspective. 
right? Is that continue? And, and that might be because I'm an engineer and I, yeah. I actually kind of run the odds of the various scenario in my head. And at times, you know, I've, I've actually, well, I think there's a 25% odds of this right now, but that changes mm -hmm. with the market dynamics, how the other companies are doing, who's got cash flow, um, this gold price. So, uh, you know, people, you always have to position the company that the company is going to build the asset. Right. Uh, and that certainly is, you know, as we've got to the scale we have, that's certainly possible. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we're preparing for. We're building the team. We're running the economics. We're understanding what the best project would be. And we have options. Right. You know, the metallurgy's told us we have options, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, you got to also look around and see what's going on. So you're not blindsided. Right. Um, and that's part of a job of a CEO is to be thinking about all the outcomes and the odds and you know do i think i'll be be running this company in five years um you know maybe but i think the odds are are lower than somebody else taking over this asset but again those change depending on the time and um everything and what's what's all going all around you twenty three hundred dollar gold price is changing quite a bit yeah um, if it sustains you know, and there's the people that think it's run too fast and it's going to pull back. Mm. Uh, but there's also a growing number of people that are like, yeah, there's just so much momentum building behind it. Um, and we'll see who's right. Yeah, I mean, I think the same, and I'm not an economist and I'm not a banker or a trader or any of those things, but just everything does seem to have fundamentally shifted in the last few years. Even that typical swing into gold, right? That didn't happen from like the traditional folks that went into crypto and tech um, who would have normally come in. And so I kind of see it as, yeah, I, I say like everything's on the table right now, right? As opposed to, or kind of as far as what may, may happen next. Um, because I don't, I think a lot of our, our models are maybe not, not so accurate anymore. <laughs> you know, like the fundamentals have shifted. Right. So you've got to play all the odds. Well, and there's so many variables like wars, right. uh, political uncertainty, um, nationalizing assets in various places, um, interest rates, all of these things playing in. Uh, your, our economists are only so good at these things and their models are only, yeah. you know, so, so good. So um, yeah. Yeah. I would hate to be an economist. I'll play. It's even probably worse than trying to think of the scenarios that might happen as a junior CEO. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to like plan for three, right? Plan for three scenarios <laughs> given time, just in case. Yeah. I think that's, that's, it's the same running a startup. <laughs> Assume that everything will fail or maybe everything will happen the way you want. Yeah. So, well, I always, maybe I learned that you remember Martin Mjornbeld, he, the, the gold monitor, he used to have the ABC scenarios and then he would put what percent on each scenario. Um, you know, that, that did actually teach me a little bit about, okay, this business isn't predictable. And I, I started reading that probably when I was 20, because I was in, you know, private gold production, alluvial production, and we were, you know, you needed something to kind of help you think about where the price of gold is going. And, you know, a pretty reputable economist who was really studying all the factors at that time that were, were influencing gold. And, you know, it makes you think, okay, that is one scenario. Here's the probability. What do I do to plan for that? And that is a bit how I run this company because my job is to make sure I protect value for shareholders and add value for shareholders. So right. in these bad times, it's been protect. And now it's how do I really advance this and add the most value for it? And it always has to be in the context of the market, uh, but you can't be so bullish. And, you know, some companies were too bullish. They spent all their money mm -hmm. drilling, thinking that drill results were, were going to be appreciated. Um, and it, it is a... It, and don't get me wrong, it is not easy because you that has traditionally been the model of how you add value. Right. Um, but it, I think that's part of the fundamental shift, too, is that that's not always going to add value. Um, what how do you actually get people interested and and, you know, really get the stock price to represent um, the value you've added? Yeah. That's the disconnect that we're seeing. I think it's it's especially non-traditional folks that I talk to because again a lot of times I'm I'm talking to investors who are tech focused and prospector might be the first mining related company they've talked to. I mean it's amazing how many of those groups I like we've never talked to anybody who even works in mining, right? And it's like um well, hopefully I don't mess it up for everyone else then. But uh you know, I think the the narrative has become more important over the last several years. And again, because it's it's not folks who have invested in exploration traditionally who are starting to take a look. So you're really starting from zero 
and you've got to tell the story of the company, the story of the asset. Um, you can't just rely on it being someone who's paying attention to, to drill results because a lot of these people have no idea how to interpret drill results, right? They, they don't know what an ore body <laughs> is supposed to look like, right? They're looking at it as they would any other company. Like, what is the company doing how, you know, what's the return? What are, What's the business plan? And I don't think as an industry, we're really used to answering questions in that format as much as other industries are. Well, we always go to the same mining investors and our decks all assume some the people know something about mining. And then, so I was down in Beverly Hills last week and I was talking to some people that are not in the mining business. Some were, but some were like, this is their first like you, their first foray into it. And, and I really realized I need another deck that goes like right back to the beginning to tell the story. Um, and so, you know, we backed right up. Here's kind of the basics of mining and here's gold prices. And um, that's actually, here's the context of it. Um, I think sometimes you get so in the weeds that you forget not everybody you're talking to uh, actually, and we're so, yeah, I got 7 million ounces now. And people are like, what does, that what does that mean? <laughs> like right now, um, you know, people in the mining business go, wow, that's great. That's big. That's really big. Um, but, you know, it is, uh, and it's partly because we're such a small business and we're so um, concentrated on the same investors. Well, there's a lot bigger group out there uh, in this world. Yeah, no, it's a, it's and things are shifting. Yep. You know, look at all the interest from, you know, Saudi Arabia, and there's been a real push for mining investment there. I think our centers of mining investment are changing as well as, and, and look, just look at the total, all the funds that have been invested in mining right now, their total value is significantly down. So they have less money to deploy. Um, so where is that new capital going to come from? Well, it's going to come from different places because capital's really changed how it's allocated. Yeah. And that's where I, uh, I'm always really excited when I'm talking to folks in non-traditional mining investment jurisdictions where there's still a lot of mining. Like I remind folks, I mean, of course, there are great projects in places like the Yukon, but mining is global and it's it takes place in a lot of developing countries where you have people that are running and funding, you know, private or, or kind of public companies that folks don't hear a lot about that that understand the business, but they're never called on to like invest in projects in North America, right? Um, so there is, there's a wide, you know, there's a, there's a lot of capital out there, but I think we've got to come up with a new methodology for it. And hopefully gold is like the, you know, kind of pulls everybody in because folks do relate to it so differently even than, than other stuff. Like, I mean, everyone's talking about critical minerals right now, which I think is awesome and I'm excited about it, but I think gold gets people like nothing else still, right? It's like an emotional, <laughs> everybody, everybody wants to own a little bit of a gold mine. So, yeah, well, and I think the other thing is the narrative around mining, like all of the movies and shows about mining have been the, the mining is the, the negative, yeah. you know, the evil person in the show. And they don't talk about it. And what we really need to do is what are we doing about building positive legacies in communities, training economic benefits, you know, taking communities out of poverty um, and actually building that up? Because there are a lot of success stories, but unfortunately, they're not movie material because there's no negative you know you can't have the evil person to have the plot and the twist and then you know win at the end um that's uh i think that's something we we as an industry need to do better is like talk about the benefits of it particularly like northern canada yeah. the impact of mining is uh is very significant and positive on a lot of northern communities and and without it uh you know it would be a very very different economy and life for many people there yeah and what so what's new with you and your your nonprofit? Are you how are things going with that? I know you're still incredibly active. You know, it's been a great journey. So we're like 13 years in. We've given out almost 2.3 million dollars. Um, and we're 100% volunteer run. So there's an awful lot of volunteer both in the projects as well as from us that, you know, really um, exponentially increase the value of that those dollars. Um, we're just in the process of adjudicating the projects for next school year, which is really exciting to see the passionate educators. And we're, we have 400000 to give out this year, and I think we have almost $800,000 in application. So I think what's interesting is we've seen the demand pick up and better quality projects, uh, people understanding what works. And these things are, you got to start small. It's just like R&D. You got to figure out what works, you know, build up, you know, the 
It's just like building up investor interest. You have to talk to communities and schools and get people engaged in the issue of getting kids to school. And what are the barriers? How can we solve this? How do we as a community get behind our schools and help solve some of these problems? So super passionate about it still, as you can see. And I know I've had teachers and parents come back and say, hey, you know, what we did in when these kids were in grade six was super successful or people that are working for, you know, Victoria Gold down the road, which benefited from some of this early money. And it's nice to say, hey, we're actually seeing the positive impacts and it's starting. And it was a little bit depressing with COVID because we did see a, a rapid decline, even though we've made some progress. Uh, but the upside of that is, is we, we do know some of the things that work. And so we can actually be trying to focus on some of those and, you know, COVID exacerbated some of them, but, you know, it means that we need to ramp up our efforts and get some more money yeah. um, to really move the dial. And if any of our listeners want to help contribute or, or support that, what what can they do? On our website, you can donate everystudenteveryday.ca or, you know, if you're in a community or an educator and you want to find out how you can get money in, in, in the Yukon right now, we haven't expanded beyond that, um, you know, find out about our programs and if, how you can put in a program. And it really, it's a community problem. It's not just something that's going to be solved uh, by schools or our money alone. It, we really need to get that understanding. It's, it's across North America, this problem of declining attendance and, and people not uh, um, understanding the importance of getting kids to school. And, and in a first world country, it's, it's going to be a really long-term negative impact for us if we don't take action and start to uh, reverse this trend. And all of the businesses, uh, whether you're in tech or mining, uh, should be concerned about this. Yeah, and I, I actually just, and I thought of you and in the group because there was just a big report that came out here um, in our in our news about the, uh, I'm forgetting the official name, not, recid- not um, basically of kids and families not, you know, sending kids to school as much since COVID um, because they basically, through remote learning, kind of thought, well, we can just get caught up remotely, right? And a misunderstanding of the the true impact of not being in person in class um, and how widespread it was across the U.S. that it was kind of just this difference and kind of understanding the value of of being in school um, that I think, at least nationally here in the U.S., folks are going to have to start paying more attention to how important it is. Yeah, it's, it's important. It's also, you know, created a lot more anxiety in students. There's all kinds of social, uh, economic and other reasons that have, have increased the stats, um, which, you know, and that's one of the things is that we encourage communities. We have a recipe of things that work. Mm-hmm. Um, we encourage communities to self-identify the challenges for their students, because especially in some of these small communities, if you've got a, a student population of 80 or, you know, less than a thousand, the solutions and, and your ability to target individual students are very different than if you've got a school, you know, some schools in the U.S., there's 2,000 kids at the school <laughs> and uh, or in southern Canada. So it's a very different approach and, and you know, uh, one size fits all doesn't work. Sure. Um, so and plus we get the community champions, which is part of the battle anyway, you know, caring adults that reach out to kids uh, at education at educational schools, mm-hmm. um, you know, really can make all the difference in changing a kid's whole whole educational journey. No, I oftentimes reflect that my my whole pathway into geology and eventually into the mining industry like started in like ninth grade earth science, right? Like I had a, a teacher who was studying for her master's in environmental science and so she used us all as students as free labor. <laughs> you know, we would we would go out and like help her collect samples and and do analysis and stuff like that as part of what we did in class. And I'm like, you know, had I not had that teacher um, you know, when I got into college and was kind of deciding between physics and in biology and I ended up in a in a geology 101 class. You know, I don't know that I would have reflected and and taken that class instead of some of the others and would have been in a completely different place you know wouldn't be drinking nearly as much bourbon on my podcast if i (laughs) if i was in physics i think i don't think the industry has quite the same (laughs) bourbon proclivities yeah but i mean it's amazing how you know the impact that it makes absolutely yeah well i wonder then um kind of full circle back around, like with everything that you're doing with Banyan and certainly I think what you said about 
education and communities is is true for mining and exploration as much as it is education, right? Not one size never fits all. Are there any lessons you've learned over the last few years in what you've been doing with the project that you also have seen that to be true? You know, um, I guess if you one, make sure that you under promise and over deliver. And, you know, you get so confident sometimes you're so excited about what you're seeing that often you can get ahead of yourself. And, you know, the natural environment is not always as it seems. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong or, or are different in mining that you don't maybe factor in. So that was an important lesson. You know, don't get too far of yourself. Uh, keep you know, stay humble because, uh, you know, as soon as you get a big head, it's easy to fall. <laughs> it's a, um, you know, develop real relationships with shareholders, uh, particularly your largest ones and direct relationships with shareholders, because those are the people that um, are, have, you know, get you there. So um, they're there to support you. They also, you know, want to understand what's going on and, and have confidence in management. So, you know, being credible is super important. Uh, there's a lot of, of promoters in the mining business and, and they do well. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to develop a mining project that, you know, I, I really believe this project will get developed. Uh, and so everything that I do is really focused on how do I improve the quality of the asset and move it towards that. What do we need to do uh, both, you know, from community, environmental, science, you know, geology, all those engineering, all those aspects. So, um, and then get good people that are smarter than you, you know, surround yourself and hire people that are different than you that have the skill sets, um, you know, and, and then just, you know, you're always learning how do you manage people and how do you, um, make sure that you're both empowering people, but also supporting them. Um, so, you know, those are all lessons that you learn as you are a CEO. And then the, the really key ones been manage your capital very well. <laughs> you know that in this market, uh, maybe there'll be a time when, when you can be spend thrift, but uh, you know, we've always been very careful on how we manage our spend and, and, uh, and that's been part of our success as well. So I'm sure there's lots more lessons that I still will learn uh, in the coming months <laughs> and years. Well, I wonder on that, Tara, like when you, if you were to talk to a new mining investor and you, they were looking at a, you know, a list of companies or a group of companies on that one in particular, the capital management, like how would you recommend that folks evaluate that? Like what should they look for in terms of capital management within a junior Oh, I go look at the financial statements and see what the G and A is, and how that compares with their market cap, and how much, how much capital they have, and then how many people they have hired for the scale of the company is also a good indicator. Um, you know, knowing who the people are, whether they're credible, um, you know, and, and have a track record of success is is one of my first things. You know, I there's some great checklists from some of the newsletter writers, and and they all kind of have the same thing. You know, management jurisdiction, you know, security of tenure, uh, geology is up there, but not the top of the list. Um, you know, is it the scale and of, of deposit? And then, you know, jurisdiction is also whether it's permittable, whether you have infrastructure. There's a whole checklist of things if you're a, a new mining investor and there's a couple newsletter writers <clears throat> that have that available for free that I often advise very new um, investors to go and take a look at. One thing I would love to see them add, though, and, and probably it's because at it from a, a tech startup is I would love to see a way that they would start to evaluate innovation <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I always think, you know, there, there should be room for folks that are trying to do things differently, whether that's a different type of team, right? Because again, you know, sometimes it looks like every, every company has the same management and board makeup, right? And, you know, it's hard to be a company doing something new and different if you've got folks that have succeeded supposedly at everything for the last 30 years, right? I mean, it's just, it runs counter to the innovation that I think we need within the industry. Um, and, and some of that has to do with, you know, also like stuff in the field or how you're structuring your, your team and your community engagement, you know? Um, I totally, I, I appreciate those checklists also. And for folks that are completely new, absolutely. You know, yeah. you want to, but do you have any thoughts on that? On what, what does innovation and doing things look like? 
that's it's really interesting. So for for mining projects that have tried to use innovative technologies rather than tried and true, even like look at the early days of electrified trucks versus diesel trucks, and um, some of that didn't go so well. And so investors got a little bit jaded. And, and so sometimes actually promoting, we are using tried and true technology that works because we know it's going to work is, is also an, a story that some investors want to hear. Um, mm. Some uh, And there is a lot of geology that is, is very basic. And then you also have to think about 43101. You know, there's some new assay technologies that, you know, are potentially less environmentally damaging, but they aren't yet 43101 compliant um and they might cost more or less but you know we're so there's a bunch of constraints too which are on the industry which kind of discourage innovation not to mention the cost of it you know it's an r d effectively cost um, and there are some things where you could be doing a lot of extra things which are interesting and technologically interesting but are they actually adding value um, like right. some of the, the new automated core logging and everything is, is really interesting. And it really depends on your posit or deposit style. How much of that information do you need that much detailed information for some deposits um, to weigh, outweigh the cost? Um, you know, I, I was actually having that conversation uh, with my staff. You know, if we were to do this all again, would we do that? Is the technology there yet? Is it worth the cost? You know, and then displacing the people because sometimes technology displaces your lower end entry level jobs. And that's super important to us. And it's been a big part of our success is that we are a small group and we can take community members that don't want to go to a big place that really need that individual mentorship and train them from individual general labor up to meaningful jobs, teching, and even maybe encourage some of them to go off to, to get degrees. Um, yeah. And you wouldn't have that if the technology replaced all of those jobs. So, you know, it's a, it's a big conversation. You need to reward it, but you also need to reward um people that are really getting some of the benefits directly to people in the community. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bigger conversation um, and it's certainly going to yeah. be really interesting because the technology is getting better. Well, and I think again, it's, it's almost similar in that disconnect, right. That we were talking about with the gold because, you know, I, I see it. And, and again, I'm a, I'm a geologist and I've worked in, a, in emerging markets where the last thing you want to do is reduce the number of people you're going to hire. Right. And you want to start with the simplest, most tried and true, because that's what's going to mitigate your risk, right? When you're when you're operating anything like that. Um, but you hear all this chatter, right? We need innovation, we need investment in R&D, we need all these things. And yet, then you don't see a lot of it happening. Right? So it's like, I, there should be a phrase like instead of greenwashing, it should be like tech washing. <laughs> People just say they want to do a lot of this stuff, but nobody has any intention or <laughs> funny because but uh, um and I'm, I'm being a little bit uh you know cavalier about it but i think it, to your point like there's a lot of stuff in the industry that is trying to true it does work the rocks don't necessarily change a whole lot right um but there are spaces where that can add value but there are a lot of places where you know doing it the good old way it's been done before and and with a, with the people uh that can be trained to do it makes the most sense right keeps the value where it should be absolutely yeah it's uh it's part of the the process it's so important to have the community involved um mm -hmm. yeah i'm looking forward to all kinds of technological innovations and we look you know we look at the the ai looking at your database and and identifying things and um you know it's if for geology it's still a little ways out there it's interesting to see the robots you know that can uh you know do things like pick up apples and you know you saw that one it's pretty amazing the where we're coming there but but a lot of the technology has been really focused on the big population and the, that goes back to mining being a very small part of the overall economy and, and economics so has there been enough attention yet really focused on what would automate or provide real value i don't i don't think we're quite there yet i think we'll see robots in our homes doing all the menial cleaning jobs before we really see them um you know moving the core and and logging for us <laughs> creeps me out we don't even have an alexa or any of those they they just yeah they 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 creep me out and i run a company that 
build AI tools. And I'm kind of one of listening well, we in took, on me. We took ours out because you do need to detach a little bit. And if everything is attached, like we had one for a while and, you know, it, it's just like, you know what? I can actually go pick up the remote and turn yeah. it off. And, right, my group, and... a little sticky pad note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, well, people with, think we're old school <laughs> oh i know yeah it's gonna be it's all right when the zombie apocalypse happens i joke we'll still be able to to do all the things and you'll have your gold bars there hopefully better buy them before they're too expensive <laughs> exactly yeah um well if you could we, we we still use this the same last question tara if you could uh, wave a magic wand and overnight tomorrow change one thing about the mining and exploration space. What would you change? Ah, you know, I love this business. Um, you know, even though it's tough and it has its cycles, um, I think it's really a challenging, good business. I think I would change and I'd love to change the disconnect between gold price and financing and I guess the yeah. other thing I would change would be a lot of the listing costs that are mm. not really adding value because that, you know, it's so expensive to run a junior public company because of a lot of yeah. the the regulatory and just plain old costs that don't, you know, you pay to the exchanges, you pay to um, various other things. So I think that that would benefit mm. the industry quite a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, it would free up a bunch more capital that could go into exploration and, and building out the value in the asset. Yeah, great, awesome. Well, thank you <laughs> so much for for coming on, and uh, look forward to hearing, of course, where you guys head next. Thanks. Yeah, it's going to be a great year. I'm pretty excited about it.